Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you, those of you who joined us yesterday, enjoyed all of yesterday's program. And indeed, if you're on the terrace at the library last night, you enjoyed the opening of the Commonwealth Games and, and the food and drink which were there. So uh, hopefully enjoyed it. It looked very good. Uh, I actually went to the opening and it looked fantastic actually there and it did look good on television. So uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we're going to talk about a very important subject this morning, um, which was impacting on all of us, um, and particularly since COVID, it, the challenges faced by the international supply chain, and, and particularly in the food sector, uh, and what skills are required to address those challenges. Um, we have a very uh, distinguished panel with us this morning uh, to discuss this, and at the end of that, I'm going to open it up for questions for the audience to ask the panel. So can I first of all introduce to my immediate left, Ms. Ms. Anoshi Sharma, who's the Executive Director of the Food Safety and Standards Authority in, of India, based in New Delhi, and the Food Fortification Resource Center. Um, Anoshi has spoken about food wastage in the past and engages with many organizations and people in India on, in the food industry. Thank you for joining us today, Inoshi. Mike Haswell to my immediate right. Mike has been involved in Malawi and Sub-Saharan Africa for almost two decades, working with high value agriculture, smallholder agricultural development, and establishing global markets for Malawi grown and added value added products. He has also been instrumental in introducing and establishing quality control measures to ensure Malawi products meet various global criteria an important point. He's also regarded globally as an expert in international trade from Malawi. Finally, he was recently appointed as the Malawi Honorary Consul designate for Wales in the UK. Welcome, Mike. Uh, Louise to my far left. Uh, Louise is director of the supply chain for Bidford, a leading food service wholesaler in the UK with a one billion turnover. I think it's one billion. Yes, yes slightly over that which is a massive turner, therefore a very big food company. Uh, Louise is responsible for ensuring the best possible outward service levels to our customers, to quote her. Her area of expertise includes warehouse management, logistics and demand planning, having worked for Bidford for nine years. She was shortlisted in the category of Wholesale Star, medal winner at the Federation of Wholesale Distributors event in November 2021. And I'm sorry, Louis, you didn't win it, no, didn't win. but you were shortlisted. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like the BAFTAs or the Oscars, isn't it, I'm afraid? Uh, to my immediate right is Dr. Breno Noons, Deputy Director of the Centre for Circular Economy and Advanced Sustainability at Aston University. Uh, uh, Breno's main interests are sustainable strategies, sustainable production systems and supply chains. Uh, Dr. Breno Noons is Senior Lecturer in Sustainable Operations Management at Aston Business School, where he is also Deputy Director of the Centre for Circular Economy and Advanced Sustainability. Lots of sustainabilities in this, Breno. Um, in June 2022, he was appointed the new President of the International Association for Management of Technology, a global organisation with a very diverse board of directors representing four continents. Welcome, Breno. Thank you, panel. My first question to the panel, I'm going to ask them four questions, um, and they're all very important in, in the process of um, the challenges facing the supply chain. And my first question is actually going to be based on food waste. Um, according to the United Nations, globally around 14% of food produced is lost between harvest and retail while an estimated 17% of total global food production is wasted in, uh, in households and 5% is lost in the food service and 2% in retail. So um, obviously households, and, uh, which is 17% and the 14% lost between harvest and retail are major percentages in food waste. Arguably, developed or, or developing countries are more responsible for at least one element impacting upon the food supply chain, which indeed is food waste. So I'm going to ask my panel, what are the causes of food waste and what is being done to address them? And I'm going to start with um, Inoshi, your, your thoughts on that question. Thank you. 
Actually, in India, you know, um, we don't have so much uh, wastage, um, uh, you know, at the household level. It's mostly if you were to say, once the produce has left the farm and it enters into the supply chain, that's when the wastage starts. So, um, most of the time, what we find is that, um, you know, in our country, whenever we have a big function, that could be a marriage, it could be any family function, there are huge gatherings. And then that's where a lot of food actually is made. And the leftover food sometimes gets wasted. Why I say sometimes is because we've got a very strong culture where any food which is leftover or is in excess is donated. So donation of food is sort of, you know, built into the culture. So people will donate food on religious occasions, places of worship provide food. Um, you would even have certain days where you would find people coming up with food and, you know, distributing it. The issue comes when, um, you know, places, um, um, for instance, food business operators, restaurants, hotels, um, small shops, they have a lot of cooked food which can't be used maybe, you know, at the end of the day. And then that gets thrown away. Now, how do we make sure that that food gets collected and is immediately shared with people who need it? So we've got big retail shops which have a lot of fresh produce, fruits and vegetables, which may get wasted. So um, what we thought was, um, you know, how we can link some of the food donating agencies and the food businesses which are making both packed food, cooked food and raw food. Let's just link these two organizations or these two sectors together. And the Food Safety Standards Authority of India, from which the department which I represent, we created uh, an online platform. So first what we did was we got all the um, food donating agencies to register on this particular platform. So we've got about 82 agencies all over the country working in most of the cities across the country. And we have an IVR platform with a toll free number and any individual, any food business can simply call that number and they get linked to the closest food donating agency in their area. That agency comes, collects the food and then distributes it. So in one, I mean, on one side, the food business don't have to worry about what's going to happen to the excess food. And the agency is actually acting as the middle, you know, um, middle agency to provide food to those who need it. But what really our role comes about is because in this entire system, you also need, say, deep, uh, you know, deep refrigerators, refrigeration to store the food. You need um, vehicles for the delivery. You need some sort of trained manpower on how, how to handle food. You also need to make sure that the um, plastic wastage in, in this entire process is also cut down and just generally create this awareness among people that this particular, you know, set a system of agencies exists. So we are working with the um, food industry associations like uh, the Chambers of Commerce, the Federation of Industries, so that a lot of um, the FBOs come to know about it. It's a very nascent project. It started about two years back, but because of the COVID, we sort of had to stall it. But the good thing was that it was during the COVID that a lot of cities actually created their own smaller food donating agencies. A lot of individuals came together um, and we then saw a large number of agencies joining our network. Mm. So that really helped. Great. Sounds a good idea. Um, Mike, any thoughts from you? Yeah, from the Malawi perspective, um, I'll break it into two sides. On the domestic side, um, food storage in Malawi is an issue. There's no refrigeration anywhere. Um, people in houses and, and villages don't have any electricity, so it's a day-to-day -day eating effect and it's daily visits to the market to buy fresh product. Um, one of the big problems we've identified with when, since working with food cities on the food wastage is that you go to the market and you've got the same product being sold by everybody. So at one time of the year you go to the market and every single person is selling tomatoes. So you can only buy so many tomatoes, but at the end of the day, those tomatoes, because they've been out in the sun all day, have to be thrown away. So there's a lot of wastage there, um, which we've identified and we're trying to put in the educational processes at the moment to get people to vary what they're growing. So one village can grow tomatoes, another village can grow uh, onions, another one can grow spinach, another one can grow cabbage. 
so that it varies the market and it gives people the opportunity to buy a varied uh, nutritional food and also it reduces the amount of waste. Um, then on to the export side and the uh, international trade side, Malawi doesn't have access to reefer containers, refrigerated containers. So everything that's exported out of Malawi is put into an ordinary 20 or 40 foot container. It's a seven, seven day journey to port. Currently, there's lots of delays in shipping, so you don't know how long your container is going to be sat at port. Uh, and it could be at the top of a stack, it could be at the bottom of a stack. So you've got food product in an ordinary container sitting in port for potentially two weeks. Then you've got transshipment issues where you could get delayed at a transshipment port for another two weeks. So you're looking at a transit time of up to 80 days for a food container to get from Africa to Europe. Um, and again, ad addressing that, we're constantly talking to shipping companies. Um, we're trying to get reefer containers coming into Malawi. Um, the big issue that we're being told is that the, there's no trucks in Malawi that can actually cope with reefer containers, no trucks with power. So again, it's, it's trying to address issues uh, like that. And we need to get government involved and obviously overseas assistance and things as well. So. There's, there's a lot to learn in Malawi on, on food export and, and containing food waste. Mm. Quite a few problems, Mike, but not, not necessarily solutions for all of them yet. There's not solutions for everything yet, but it's still developing. Thank you, Mike. Louise. Um, so obviously with, within Bid Food, we deliver to anyone that's got a commercial kitchen or you know, a, a prison, a hospital, a school, a pub, a restaurant. Um, and what we found over, especially during COVID, it's been very difficult to know what our sales volumes are going to be. We've seen a lot of fluctuation in demand. Um, we get lots of uh, different things that sort of go in and out of fashion. So obviously at the moment, sort of things like veganism, very popular. Um, but that can lead to food waste, you know, on meat products that might come um, sort of, you know, unannounced to us. So what we're trying to do is manage our um, food waste through better customer forecasting, etc. But then actually looking at what we can do with the food waste. So we're a, a supporter of Fair Share within the UK. So we'll try to donate. We're actually looking at setting up our own sort of um, bank of food banks that are actually associated to our business without the, throughout the country um, and looking at um, aerobic and digestion as well so we can actually start to use the food to energy um, program to actually change that food waste into energy that can be used so for us food waste is a real problem um, but a million pounds worth of a year of actual physical food and um, that bid food would waste uh, in a normal year but for us it's about trying to minimise that as much as we can, but actually with that waste, what can we do to support the local communities, but also what can we do to do something good with the food waste that we produce? Right. None of the panel at this stage get involved in recycling that at all by other means rather than donating it? Uh, so we recycle it through the um, annual um, sort of digestive programme, so that, that, that is used for that. It's just really starting in the last sort of six months or so but obviously there's lots of businesses now within the UK that are starting to use mm. that um, as a sort of you know new, new f fuel provider yes um, so I think that will sort of grow arms and legs over the next few years great because I know we had yesterday at the mezzanine modus I think they're called oh, right, about okay. food yeah. they actually use the food waste to create energy and yeah etc yeah. etc et yeah. so it might be worthwhile I don't know whether he's here today I can't see him in the audience but that was very good um, well, thank you, panel, for your answers on that, that problem with food waste. I certainly understand from the UK's point of view, we probably cut our food waste within the last five years by about 25%. But I think there's still a hell of a long way to go yeah. with that. And obviously food banks, which have become necessary anyway for other reasons, are, are a useful way of helping with that. The next question is slightly overlapping, but I think this is a much broader question. The pandemic has highlighted significant weaknesses in current supply chain resilience, uh, and clearly so has the war in Ukraine. So the question to the panel is going to be, what can supply chains do to address these challenges, such that all of the challenges faced by the supply chain? And in my research, I've identified about 25, uh, varying in scale to local challenges, to international challenges, so there's plenty of scope to deal with challenges, and there are plenty of challenges. Um, so what can the supply chains do to address these challenges? And importantly, what skills do you think are needed or lacking in the supply chain to do so? So Louise, I'm going to ask 
you again on this one. Yeah, okay. Um, so we probably could be here all day talking about what <laughs> supply chain challenges the, uh, the country faces. And obviously, my world is more sort of UK based than sort of um, Mike, to be fair. Um, obviously, we are seeing, or our suppliers are seeing, sort of huge raw material shortages, um, particularly you know with the problems in Ukraine, but also climate change, crop failures, etc. Really does have a knock-on effect um, to the actual raw products being available to go into manufacturing within the UK. Uh, manufacturing within the UK has been obviously affected by Brexit. Uh, lots of the sort of workforce moving back to Europe and coming out of the the workforce itself and recruitment in that sector at the moment is absolutely dire, really difficult to recruit people into the manufacturing sector, mm. uh, which is, I think, really what sort of government should be looking at um, in terms of new apprenticeships, etc. You know, how can we make food attractive for people? It's almost, to me, a little bit like manufacturing jobs, a sort of an accidental career um, and not a desired one. And I think that's something that uh, we need to look at as a, as a country. Um, and an educational system. So we've got the raw material shortages. We've also got the increased sort of freight costs, the port congestion um, that we're facing at the moment, which is likely to get worse now that we're likely to see uh, strikes in Felixstowe, etc., cetera, um, which could have a knock-on effect to the UK sort of Christmas and the Christmas economy. Change in customer demands as well is really quite difficult. Um, I think we call it the sort of Amazon effect where everybody wants everything tomorrow um, and supply chain doesn't really work like that. You know, we'll be looking at a 12 to 14 week lead time to get product in from China, which is now likely to be 18, 19 weeks. Um, and customers expect things to be ordered today and with them tomorrow, which is a, a real challenge for us. Um, and really sort of lack of investment in production facilities within the UK. Um, particularly while we were going through the sort of Brexit process that nobody really knew whether we were staying or going and we all know where that ended up. Um, so, you know, that was difficult and many, com many companies didn't invest within their um, plants within the UK, um, which has led to lots of problems for us as well. Um, and cash flow for businesses, you know, businesses won't stockpile, you know, refrigeration now just to run the cost of a refrigeration unit for any supplier is immensely expensive. So, you know, our suppliers are holding much less stock than they used to. Um, so therefore, it's more difficult for you know, us as a business to bring stock in to take it out into the network. And from a supply chain, you know, what we can do. I think it's about looking at you know what is supply chain and who are we feeding as a nation so the government when you read the news to me you'll look at the empty supermarket shelves in Lidl or Aldi or Tesco but actually businesses like mine that support you know the MLJ schools hospitals you know we are a frontline service and, and that was shown in Covid when you know we delivered the care packs to the um, vulnerable people right throughout the pandemic you know our industry is critical to feeding you know the vul most vulnerable people the needy people in society um, and I think a lot of the time we focus on feeding ourselves as consumers and not necessarily actually looking at what the rest of supply chain does in the, in the UK. So lots of challenges. Um, skills that we need really, lots that we need to, to address really, investment, right. skills, etc. Quite diverse shortage in skills. Mike, I wanted to... I'd just like to add uh, on to something Louise said. Um, I, I had an experience with a client who's a global uh, blue chip company in the food industry and they approached us on when you were saying about cash flow they approached us and said we have to change our payment terms uh, so they're they're looking at farmers to supply them and they were looking at payment terms of 140 days from date of invoice farmers cannot sustain themselves with terms like that and I think you know you you said about cash flow and I think it's, a, it's an important factor no, that was on my list of about 25, so that's one off the list, 24 to go. Breno, do you want to come on? And perhaps the yeah, emphasis on, I know there's issues with uh, access to technology, whether that's something you can... Uh, yes, uh, I mean, first of all, th thanks for inviting me, Keith, and uh, everyone in, in the organising team. It's been a wonderful uh, event so far. I think let me just start by kind of bringing up the magnitude of the challenge that the food industry is going to face in, in the coming months, perhaps, or years. Nobody knows how, for how long the, the conflict is going to last. But um, Russia and Ukraine, they are responsible for 25% of their wheat production, uh, world's wheat production, 
60% of sunflower oil, 30% of barley, and 20% of maize. These are major products that end up in our supermarket shelves. Um, if we just think about, this is on the production side. If we think in terms of the uh, productivity side, they are either number one, number two, or number three in the production of fertilizers for nitrogen fertilizers, phosphorus, and potassium. Triple yummy now. They are major producers of energy, which is another great input for food supply chains. So we're talking that increasing oil prices, energy prices, um, and also disruption of the chip industry and circuits that could eventually lead to delay in delivering machinery, delivering vehicles to produce, distribute uh, 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 products throughout the whole supply chain. When we move into the into the uh, solution side, I think, thanks for that very easy task. <laughs> uh, there is no silver bullet there. It's actually a combination of uh, actions that will lead to a more robust supply chain. And in that particular case, my work is not just on the food supply chain. We can learn from all the supply chains on how they have faced several disruptions throughout the year and for several different reasons. For, uh, you know, severe weather events like supply chains in Taiwan or, or disruption due to social uh, issues in, in Europe or Southeast Asia, uh, but also long-term and slow onset events like urban migration that, uh, that leave you know, the, the skills on, on, on the countryside, on the farms. Eventually, the, the, the following generation comes, to, comes to, to, to urban areas to work. Uh, I think on the solution side, the very first thing is probably to upgrade the national agricultural systems. Uh, that, that comes from increasing productivity. So I'm originally from Brazil. I've done work in local development in Brazil, very rudimentary uh, food production systems. The way a family managed a farm in Brazil, uh, in the northeast of Brazil, in the semi-arid lands, is completely different from my brother-in-law's family in Ireland, or the farms that I visit here in the UK. So uh, automation, if it is dairy production, uh, other, I think other, other solutions at supply chain level uh, might include uh, start identi identifying alternative solutions or alternative substitute products for what is going to be in disruption in three or, or six months' time. Because we have the forecasting uh, in place, we kind of know what price is gonna 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 shoot up. Uh, I was uh, very recently in Croatia with uh, a CEO of a, a supermarket chain, and they were already looking at possible solutions to substitute products, change suppliers to avoid panic buying, and that's perhaps a legacy, a learned lesson from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I think, Akifa, I might want to stop there and, and then leave uh, space to other people. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to comment on what Mike's saying? Maybe. Uh, no, just wholeheartedly agree, really, with, with what you're saying. Um, yeah, it's just certainly a challenging time for us all. Um, yeah, um, it, yeah. There is no silver bullet. You're absolutely yeah. right on I, that. I, I, if I can just add a final point, I think the, the other important aspect that we have learned throughout the uh, COVID pandemic, and even we changed our language about it, is on the, uh, that not all products are created the same. Right? We do understand that there are essential products and there are non-essential products. If you've been you know, online shopping throughout the pandemic and then you had an Amazon Prime account, you would see that sometimes you'd get a message from Amazon saying, I'm sorry, I cannot deliver this in one day as I promised. I will need to deliver more essential products for people that are missing. Yeah. You know, uh, loads of supermarkets had to make difficult choices as well. Products that were more profitable but were not essential. And I think with moments of crisis, uh, societies, cities, they will need to reflect on what is essential and what is not. Yeah. So I think some of the main points coming out of that were customer demand changing. Yep. Yeah. And therefore yeah. you're not necessarily geared up to that demand and maybe they're expecting, we are expecting too much. Yeah. Also uh, changing suppliers and indeed we're too reliant on certain sources and Ukraine's a good example of that, that the world is too reliant on one country for wheat um, 
and therefore that's something I think we've learned with COVID before Ukraine yeah, yeah. came along. Mm -hmm. Cost of freight, I know the containers have gone up, up to what, 10 times? 10 times about. the cost yeah, of what they were, yeah. which obviously is impacting. Plus the containers are still in the wrong place in the world, I think. Yeah. yeah. China's hogging a lot of them, yeah. I understand. Yeah, and um, obviously we've got the haulage issue then. When you get the, the cleared through the ports, there are limited drivers to be able to take, uh, pick up those containers and drivers. actually deliver them to where they need to go. Yes, and then you mentioned uh, Breno upgrading um, the uh, organisational systems. Yeah, uh, n not just in organisations. I take a systemic view of that because if a farm itself improves productivity internally, but all the access, as Mike was saying earlier, in terms of road and port infrastructure are not there, then you cannot facilitate uh, 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 excessive production in one location to supply to a location of scarcity. Mm. So we need to have these the, use, use technology in an appropriate way. Uh, I know there is a lot of talk about IoT, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, but there are limitations, mainly when we're talking about global uh, 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 production systems. So there are uh, places where um, the farms do not have mobile coverage. So, I mean, we're talking about apps that you can go then and scan a QR code and then can get real-time communication between the supermarket and the farm. But that's not the reality of many, many places where the food is produced. Mm. So you, you touched, Louise, a little bit on the skills. I, we talked about drivers, and I think yeah. generally you talked about recruitment. So problem. Are there any particular skills you're aware of in, in, in the sector, in the supply chain, which are needed? Um, I mean, at the moment, I mean, lots of skills, even at the sort of the, the end user point of view. So we are really struggling as a hospitality industry with chefs, kitchen staff, etc. So the actual demand on food is changing. So people are not scratch cooking so much in kitchens. So they want more produced food, which also then has a knock on on the availability of the supply chain. Our manufacturers geared up for that. So you need to look at it not just in supply chain, but it's who are the end users of the food that we're all producing. Um, and what skills do those people need to offer mm. a good value for money? You know, the cost of living crisis at the moment, you know, potential recession coming our way, that will impact how consumers um, perform and how they react and the way they live their lives, which then has a greater knock-on in the supply chain as well. So we need to look at you know, skills in that avenue. You know, the haulage industry you know, was on its knees during COVID, has recovered um, slightly. Um, but you've got things like, you know, the seasonal workers, again, with the Brexit effects, you know, 40,000 visas that the UK offered this year for seasonal workers. I don't actually know the numbers that were actually taken up, but I know it's nowhere near 40,000. So, you know, we've got a huge labour problem in the country, which is having a huge knock on effect throughout the supply chain. And, mm. uh, and then goes on to the food waste piece. You know, if you've got fruit and veg and flowers that are rotting in the fields, that's yes. where they'll stay. And so. presumably, the labour side relates to overseas, not just in the UK. Yeah, no, in that's case, right. That's importing here. Yeah. What about yeah. things like uh, lack of traceability and transparency? Is that a big issue at all? Um, for us, uh, obviously, most I mean, about eighty percent of the business that we do is within the UK and UK manufacturing, um, or sort of China and a little bit um, from Australia. So they are sort of you know within our food regulations, etc. So for us, in traceability, customers want more traceability, and we are doing sort of farm to fork traceability uh, within our within our business. So I think from a UK point of view, you know we're quite comfortable sort of where we are as a business but I know sort of might you find it a, yeah, a I mean, different story. It's one of the challenges we get. Um, we, grow, we grow product commercially and with all the CSR stuff our clients want we also have contracted smallholder farmers so we have, to, we have to be able to trace every item of food that we send out has to be traced back to an individual farm or a, a farmer. Trying to get rural uneducated Malawi farmers to understand things like allergens, traceability is very, very difficult. And it, it doesn't take a, a week, a month, it takes years to get them to realize what this is all about and why it's needed. Um, but again, we, we're getting there and they are waking up to the fact that if they need to export product out of Malawi, they need to meet regulations. One of the issues we've got, I know Louise, we've spoken about it, the regulations seem to change every year. So 
once you've got them trained up on something, regulations change, they're out of date and you've got to tell them something else. And sometimes you're contradicting what you've already told them. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's a difficult industry to be in. Um, but it, you know, I don't think the challenges will ever stop. <laughs> and I presume that but, traceability, sorry, the, 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 the regulations vary across the world. Yeah, I mean, there's different so regulations and different, different levels. Um, standards. So different right. standards. I mean, labels. You've, you've got a, a food aflatoxin, ocratoxins, pesticide residues, all that sort of stuff. And it does vary. Each, each continent and country does vary in, on what they allow as oh. an acceptable um, parameter for, for you to send in. More challenges, but obviously exporting yeah. is important to countries. Exporting is very important to a country like Malawi. Um, with very little forex coming in otherwise. So it's... Uh, it creates jobs, creates wealth. Yeah. So that's, that's, yep. that's necessary. Thank you, uh, colleagues, for that one. Uh, our third question, and this really relates to cities in particular, um, which is focusing on the supply chain challenges facing cities. Um, cities, of course, are affected by local, national and international supply chain challenges. So the question is, what can be done at city level to address these challenges. And I'm going to start with Inoshi from your thoughts on that. Um, so, you know, generally, if you look at cities, even otherwise, I mean, not just the pandemic, otherwise also they have so many challenges starting right from the fact, um, if you look at particularly like, if I were to take the Indian example, cities have huge populations which are migrating from the uh, peri-urban or the rural areas and, you know, just joining in at the urban areas. So the um, density of population there is extremely high. So naturally, when you have uh, certain pockets with high population concentration and you've got um, very little area where you're actually growing food, so you're dependent on the neighboring areas for that supply chain to be maintained. In regular times also, it becomes extremely important that, you know, those supply chains come uninterrupted. Now, in a situation of a pandemic, it's, it, it's just even more difficult because, you know, in rural areas, you could have your own produce, you could have your neighbors produce, you could share and you can get over that time. But in a city, you are dependent on that one particular shop or a market from where you're going to buy. Uh, the good thing, of course, um, I mean, the one thing that I think in India is that we're not dependent so much on the supermarkets for packed food or pre-packed food, but because people cook, and they need fresh produce. At least uh, when the pandemic happened, the first thing that we did was make food the essential service, which means the supply chains did not get interrupted at all. So the um, fresh produce from the neighboring areas to all the cities, they were allowed to enter. Similarly, milk, similarly, um, the vegetables, the fruits. Um, there was some time where the supply of the eggs got hampered a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because again, you know, those uh, poultry farms are a little further away from the cities and for them to enter took time. And of course, the storage of those eggs did create a lot of challenge. But that supply chain was maintained. What becomes really essential also is that with food, um, you also have to see what kind of a food is the city demanding. It's not just the um, fresh produce. But um, the consumption of, say, the packed food or the pre-packed food is more than, say, in rural areas. And therefore, um, the, what do you say, the testing or ensuring that no food frauds are happening or the, um, like, we have this issue of food frauds or adulteration happening. And these foods are easily available more in urban areas than, say, so much in rural areas. So keeping a check on them also becomes quite a priority. Thank you, Inoshi. And can I have some comments from you on this, Mike? Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to Malawi again. Um, Mizuzu is the third city in Malawi up in the north. They had their first supermarket five years ago. And it's at the end of the delivery route for um, the trucks that come in from South Africa on imported products. And the manager there is always frustrated because Whatever he orders from the suppliers in South Africa, he doesn't get because all the supermarkets between South Africa and Mizuzu take what they want and basically he gets what's left on the truck. And there's no way they will change their routes. So it, it causes a problem because people have now become reliant on that supermarket. In, even in the short time of five years, people 
from, from the local area to expat, expat communities there have become reliant on one supermarket and they seem to have forgotten what they used to do before the supermarket appeared. So that, that's a big issue in the supply chain um, f from the processors to, to the consumer at the end on the supermarket. Uh, route. The other issue we've got in Malawi is the infrastructure, which is a huge problem. Um, the, the roads, there's two roads which basically go the length of the country. One goes up uh, the lake shore and the other one goes up the middle of the country. The one up the middle of the country is the newest road which was built about 12 years ago and was a nice wide road you could overtake easily. It's now down to a single lane road in both directions. Heavy trucks go on, they just demolish the road, they hit the, hit the edge of the road um, and just keep making the road smaller and smaller by about a meter every year. Now again, the government are fully aware of it but haven't got the finances to mend the road on a, it's about an 800 kilometer length. So again, only sort of 10, 20 kilometers gets done each year. And by the time they've reached the end, they've got to start again. So it's a continuous battle there. Um, as Inoshi was saying, a lot of people are bringing fresh food in from rural areas. Their reliance on either coming in by bike, walking in, or getting a lift on the back of a truck. So again, it's very sporadic and irregular how these people are coming in. So yeah, it's, it's, it's issues, and I think, I think it's pretty, pretty much to say, fair to say that that's a, a global issue in slightly underdeveloped countries. Apparently, urban freight is expected to increase to, to by forty, by forty percent by two hundred and fifty. Uh, and the problem with that, of course, is that apparently also it's estimated that twenty five percent of carbon dioxide emissions and thirty to fifty percent of other pollutants are caused by urban freight. And of course, with retail shops and stores closing and everybody going to e-commerce, online buying is going to be a lot more trucks on the road. So we need to factor in the impact of a lot more trucks on the road and the, the, the danger to obviously the, the climate as a result of that. So uh, one problem seems to cause another. Um, do you want anything you want to comment on that, Brenda? Yes, I think, uh, of course, in, in, in a city, because of the various issues that we have uh, mentioned before, some of the technological applications are easier. For instance, uh, a lot of companies have already embarked in using electric vans for delivery. So they, good. you know, because congestion charges, or uh, it's not all good altruism, but you know, because it's simply common sense, it costs less, mm. there's less uh, maintenance in an electric van. And then of course you can claim all the, the green PR that comes with it. Uh, I think there are other important things that we need to bear in mind, which is the power of entrepreneurs in, in, in cities. So here in, uh, in the UK, we have a company called Toast Ale. So they get their rejected you know, from, from, from bakeries to, 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 to produce beer. Uh, there's another company called Smack that uses uh, reject from, from fruits and vegetables and cereals that are simply perfectly good for consumption, but they're not aesthetically acceptable by supermarkets. And, 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 and this company just takes these, uh, what would be waste, and produce cereal and fruit bars. So th there, are, there is business behind uh, uh, these initiatives. This is all part of uh, circular economy approaches. Uh, it's not always very easy, but I think in, the cities are the perfect places to incubate these ideas and to scale them up. Louise, have you moved, think um, of moving across to electronic? Yes, yeah, so we've started, so within our Battersea uh, depot, we've started to use electric vehicles. I and mean, the problem with any vehicle at the moment is a two-year lead time yep. for any yeah. new, new freight vehicle at the moment. Um, but yeah, we've, we've got a plan to run Including that trucks. So. And yeah, that, yeah, so our sort of vision, sort of 2030, is to have half our fleet on running on electric vehicles. And do you find delivering and getting goods to cities changed over the years for you? Um, it's changed mm. it, definitely because of the congestion zones and you've got certain times that you've got to be in and out of mm. city centres, particularly um, London, Birmingham, Manchester, um, and recently in Glasgow as well. So yeah, it has um, 
changed and all, but also our customer demand has changed so all the bits we were talking about earlier on about cash flow customer demand where customers would have had one delivery a week before they are now expecting two or three deliveries a week so you're going to the same drop with less more often uh, which from an environmental point of view is and financial point of view mm. it's not really sustainable sort of you know moving forward but and for me for cities the other bit i just wanted to talk about was People need to see, you know, manufacturing and, and food and supply chain within our cities. You know, four million people within the UK employed in that sector is really, really important. Lots of deprived areas are on the back of supply chain, food, manufacturing, etc. And I don't think it's given the importance within the country that it should be. Thank you. And our final question for the panel, um, and this is something I'm sure we can all come in with and with, with our expectations, but whether it'll actually happen. Is uh, what can government do to help with the food and drink supply chain challenges? I'm going to start with you, Breno. I've got a list, by the way, of what government can do. Oh, oh so I'll let them know what my thoughts will be, but I always add to it. Let's hope the candidates are, are listening. <laughs> um, and this is internationally, of course, not Oh, just. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, governments do play a massive role, uh, uh, particularly when uh, there is no... Uh, there is an incipient business case for companies to act. So, uh, be it, you know, through government procurement. So, a lot of uh, uh, the best-selling, well, the best clusters in agriculture, they have been strongly associated with government procurement. Mm. Be it to, uh, to, 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 to tackle food security in the places. So, in, you know, a, again, with essential goods like milk for, for schools, or uh, uh, meat or grains. Uh, I think that's probably the very first port of resource for, co uh, for governments to kind of tap in uh, local vocations, local skills, uh, uh, local strengths that the, the food supply chain, the national food systems have uh, to scale up. Because when you scale up, then it becomes easier. Then, we, then governments will need to do the bits that, again, governments, uh, they, they, that they actually supposed to do because companies were not going to go there uh, 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 to build up the, the roads, to build up the ports and the, the technological infrastructure that are necessary for us to avoid food waste, such as, you know, uh, mobile coverage or, or, or uh, uh, aspects on, on, on waste recycling systems, waste systems. So I think these are, these are very important aspects. I think the last thing I would like to add is that... Uh, Legislation alone, we talk a lot about how countries can learn from each other in terms of legislation, but my experience in working in, in, in Brazil, in, in Thailand, uh, and a little bit with colleagues from South Africa as well, is that legislation alone will not uh, uh, guarantee a sustainable food system. So we still, if we do not have a particular uh, government action to enforce the legislation properly, and to go beyond command and control to instruct companies, to reward companies that do well, uh, it, we're going to continue uh, seeing uh, negative impacts on the environment and cases of modern slave in, in, in many countries where food supplies can play a big role in the export. Yeah, I think it's a good point about legislation being enforced. I think we all, in our daily lives, come across things which we see which the government should be enforcing, but they don't presume it for lack of resource or lack of money in every country. Interesting point there. Yeah, I mean, we, we have all been seeing lately in the news a lot of the uh, advances in deforestation in the Amazon area, mm. and the, which is strongly linked with soya production, and uh, which is, by the way, to feed cattle, right? So Brazil is the, is the largest uh, 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 beef production uh, in the world. There are also uh, large production of poultry, and a lot of that requires... Grain. So today, uh, uh, you don't have anymore a single agent from an environmental uh, protection agency going, going there and looking where it was deforested. It's all satellite images. And then you can get in real time, and then you can show, say, listen, if you don't, if you don't do this, sanction is going to be applied. Right? So I think technology in, the, in these cases, they, require, they can have an immediate effect. They require very little change mm. in terms of or, or investment effort in education or changing behavior. They can have an immediate effect because you have uh, real-time uh, uh, reliable data that can be shared across uh, buyer and suppliers. Yeah, particularly the point about deforestation in, yep. in Brazil, which we all know about, of course, for 
and carbon, the carbon And the carbon impact. emissions that come yeah. along with that. Louise, any thoughts from you? Um, I mean, for me, for, for government, and again, speaking sort of from a UK point of view, it is looking, you know, their food strategy is to, you know, look after the food supply chain as it is today, but sort of, you know, protect it for the future. I don't think we're doing anything really to protect it for the future in the main. Um, you know, 75% of what we consume in the UK currently is produced in the UK, but the skilled workforce is diminishing, you know, day on day. So if you take the butcher's industry as, as an example... You know, everyone sort of thinks, you know, my mum used to go to the butchers. You don't have that necessarily anymore. But all of the prepared meats is butchered by skilled people at a manufacturing plant. Those skilled people do not exist anymore. Um, so it's getting more and more difficult. So for me, government have to look at the gaps within our skill set within the UK for, to sustain the future of supply chain uh, for food within the UK. And then looking at, you know... So to be fair, the Ukraine uh, situation, I think, caught us all by surprise. You know, I mean, 35% of our white fish came from Russia. Nobody really knew that. Everyone's now complaining mm -hmm. it's costing £10 for fish and chips at the local fish yep. and chip shop. That'll probably go up by another two or £3 in the next couple of um, oh. months, to be honest. So that I think the government, we need to be less reliant on certain areas of the world, try as a as a country to be more self-sufficient you know we've got a great nation great people we just need to actually invest in that and build us with technology as well to actually mm. make it more sustainable and support our farmers you know they need support with the energy prices the way they're going at the moment farmers will go out of business and they won't return so i think the government really needs to act fast on in that area Great. Enough any quick comments for you? Or? Yes. Um, you know, I mean, because I sort of work with the government, I am part of the government. That. You know, many times what happens is you also have to bring about a change. I mean, I find it very interesting what you just said about, you know, sometimes you just need to introduce a topic of conversation to have a debate and then, you know, just create that public opinion. For instance, front of the pack labeling, it talks about foods which are high in salt, fat, sugar. They can talk about positive nutrients that a particular food has. It's just a debate that we're having, but it's amazing in the past two years, when we just floated this idea, it was something that we got very little um, you know, comments about, but in the past six months, it's really being debated upon. In every second forum that you find, the front of the pack labeling is being talked about. And why that becomes really important is because in a country where, like I mentioned yesterday, out of 10 deaths, six are related to NCDs. And there is a growing segment of people who are shifting to this kind of packed food, which is high in salt, fat, sugar. It becomes really mm. important. Then if you've got a regulation which tells you about schools not being able to sell foods which are high in salt, fat, uh, you know, HFSS foods around them, that's another positive step that's been taken up. Mm. So these are the kind of things. Then, you know, one of the things like you mentioned about agriculture or the food products that you're growing, for instance, traditional indi indigenous um, you know, cereals in our country, which were millets, we have thousands of varieties of millets. Yep. And over a period of time, gradually people have stopped growing those and they've shifted more to just rice and wheat mm -hmm. or maybe sugarcane or cotton or maize because they give you a better return in terms of the prices. But it doesn't necessarily mean that in the long run it's actually good for that particular soil or it's actually going to keep you in a profit because they need more pesticides, they need more fertilizers, they need more water. So this kind of a debate which we are having, and the um, 2023 is the International Year of Millets. So there's this big conversation again we're having, how can various departments popularize millets? How can we celebrate you know, indigenous grains that we have so that people start consuming them? When people demand, that's what you're going to have more. I mean, I always feel if people demand better education, the government's bound to open more schools. If they demand local food, the government's bound to give them local food. So it all, again, depends on the kind of demands that we are generating on one side and then ensuring the supply of those things also happening. So it's both ways. I think just adding on to what Inoshi said and, and also uh, Louise, the UK is, and, and the world is reliant on Ukraine a lot for, for wheat, it's reliant on China. We're here as a commonwealth. Why, why don't we develop commonwealth countries to help us produce food? Africa is sitting there with potential to, to feed Europe. Um, it just takes a bit of investment. So why not invest there and get food into the UK and another 
countries and you know, develop and invest in the Commonwealth again. You'd hope with 56 countries that yeah. that were possible. We need a strategic plan at Commonwealth level, Commonwealth Secretariat level. Yeah, in instead of countries that we're, we sort of seem to be opposed all the time with. Hmm. And, uh, and I, I think, if I may add to that, uh, I think one of the important aspects is what Louise raised as, as the food strategy. Because when, when, you, when you decide the direction that you want to take, it becomes much easier to develop a plan on the back of that. Yeah. So all the solutions I mentioned earlier about localizing supply chains, reshoring them, or French shoring as we want to say, mm. we, we need to have a plan, we need to have a strategy, the direction where we're going to go, so you can actually say the best investment for Malawi is this, the best investment for, for India is this. Yeah. Perhaps you have experimentation on, on, on new concepts such as like vertical farming or urban mm. farming, in particular areas of the Commonwealth and where it can, quick, can be quickly duplicated and, 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 and the technology can be transferred to other countries because you are working in a group of, 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 of uh, friendly countries, let's put it yeah, that way. Yeah. I'm going to cut a short there, colleagues, because I just want to give the audience a few minutes to ask questions. We've got an audience, hopefully, so from questions. Um, I'll let the lady be first because she's a lady, Jen. So, uh, Shalene. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to repeat what Lloyd just said. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's polite. Obviously not. <laughs> um, so obviously Mike ended on a point, um, mm. which is incredibly important, but how do we strike the balance um, between um, supporting the rapid development of a country and ensuring that the food that's produced is also consumed by the citizens and not directed to Europeans? Sorry, Mike, I know that's... That's all right. right. <laughs> I, I think, the, yeah, the balance would be that the food is, is consumed within that country as well. I mean, it, it's there for their use and obviously to come into the UK or Europe. But the fact that there's investment and development there would obviously increase and improve the lives of people there. And it would increase and improve opportunity to grow more products for themselves. Um, I guess it's just thinking about the history of the Commonwealth and that hasn't necessarily played out and I think it would take experts to inform the development of a strategy that totally ensures yeah. that mm -hmm. citizens of the countries are benefiting from incredible production of food as well as elsewhere. Mm. Good point. Yeah. Two questions. A gentleman in the white shirt. I'll come to you, Mike. There's a mic coming your way. Sorry, you've probably got a white shirt on as well at the back, but you're in the shadow a bit more. It's me this time. Uh, to the right of me, I have a, a, a person, Simon, who creates baby food. This is mainly directed, I guess, again at Mike. He delivers, he delivers baby food, or will be, to the Middle East in reefers. Surely if you can get a plant down in the likes of Malawi, where we can get a, a reefer delivered into a plant and get a bilateral th uh, thing going, whereby you can uh, also ship back again, get the reefers cleaned out and ship back again, that means you have nutrition for children, along with a service for Europe and the UK generally. It may be one to have a word with Simon about. Yeah, what I will say on that, it's, it's not through lack of trying that we haven't got reefers coming up to Malawi. Um, a lot of the shipping companies won't release the containers. Um, they're, they're keeping them in sort of Southern Africa. Um, I mean, Byra has very few reefer containers coming out of port there and that's the nearest port to us um, and, and the reason we one of the reasons we use Baira is transport costs from the north of Malawi down to Baira just road transport without the shipping costs have quadrupled in the last three months partly answered your question hopefully not all that and I think the gentleman right at the back corner thank you I'm conscious we've got one minute according to the programme, so we've either got to eat into your coffee break or uh, 
Isn't it? Hi, good morning. My name is Mark Driver. I work for Minor Weir and Willis. We're a major importer of fresh, fresh produce, especially from Africa. You've mentioned about changing suppliers. I also change customers because they don't fit with what we believe as a company. There aren't many customers out there between the consumer that ever ask me for a sustainable price. They ask me for the lowest price. So actually, this, our supply chain has to include everybody in the whole loop. Back to that lady over there. It's no good us taking products from another country and starving those people. You feed the people before they can feed us. And that's the only way to be, and you're right. Our history of working with Commonwealth countries is not fantastic. And we, as a generation now, are guilty, and now we've got a chance to turn it around. So I, I absolutely believe, choose your customer well as well, because they're not all on the same hymn sheet. Definitely not. Interesting point. Okay. Thank you. One other question, I think, here on the front row, and then we'll, uh, we'll finish. Thank you. And obviously, we've got the cafe networking session later, which hopefully you're all coming to. And I think all the panel will be at that. So you can have another chat with them and also in the coffee break. Hi. Uh, not a question, actually, but quick comments. First of all, I think this session was very informative. But just I would like to add two points. One, I think as far as city level food supply chains are concerned, most of them are sourcing their produce from the nearby rural areas. And most of them are very, very small producers. That's the case with most of the cities. And I think we need to invest heavily in cold storage infrastructure to strengthen supply chain because what happens mostly is that at the end of the day, at the end of the rush hour, most of the food is dumped at much lower prices or it is not reaching the places where demand is there. That is point number one. And we have to make that cold storage infrastructure affordable to very, very small producers, maybe organizing them into cooperative societies or farm producer companies, some way or the other. Secondly, I think still there is a lot of gap in price discovery mechanism amongst cities in the same region. That is often seen as price fluctuation. We have seen it in price fluctuation in case of onions, we have seen it in case of price fluctuation in case of lemons. So uh, an efficient price discovery mechanism in places that are at least geographically accessible should be put into place. India launched the national agriculture market that has been quite successful but that has been there mostly for large bulk trading if it can be extended to small producers a price discovery mechanism, it would benefit the producers as well as consumers. Thirdly, I think uh, in the past few years, we have seen that international supply shocks have had great effect on uh, the prices, especially food commodities that are uh, mostly imported or exported. So I think it's time that some robust mechanism is put into place to ensure that food is not used as a negotiating tool or a diplomatic tool. And that would give some sort of a risk cover to export exporting units also. So suppose I am a wheat exporter in Ukraine or in some country, I should have some third party guarantee, either maybe from the WHO or some underwriting that whatever be the international scenario, my supply chain to my exporters would not be disturbed. If some sort of a guarantee mechanism can be put into place, it would benefit in two ways. First, the risk of the food producers or the food exporters would come down. That would eventually lead to a cost uh, decrease. Secondly, it would ensure supply of regular food stuff to countries that are mainly dependent on imported grains. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure we've got no, no further time for further questions. So say, please talk to the panel if you can in coffee break, if you're coming to the cafe session later. Again, I think all, all of the panel will be at that and they'll be talking about the same, be able to help you there as well. So thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day and, and, and downstairs for coffee. Thank you.